We would like to thank Sanofi Genzyme for providing an unrestricted grant to support the IACH webinar series. My name is Dr. Catherine Lee, and I practice blood and marrow transplantation and cellular therapy at the Huntsman Cancer Center at the University of Utah. Today, I will be speaking about updates in the management of chronic graft versus host disease. These are my disclosures. I would like to start off with the clinical case. Mr. Stiff is a 60-year-old male diagnosed with high-risk acute myeloid leukemia who underwent a matched unrelated donor peripheral blood stem cell transplantation and complete remission one. His transplant was complicated with acute graft versus host disease of the lower gastrointestinal system that responded to first-line treatment with corticosteroids and were tapered off at seven months post-transplant. Mr. Stiff lives three hours away and has a hard time driving to the bone marrow transplant center. He missed three monthly appointments and presented six months ago with progressive dryness of his mouth and itchy eyes. He complained that his mouth was so dry and sore to the point where he has not been able to eat full meals and lost about 10 pounds over one month. He purchased artificial tears for his dry eyes and used them seven to eight times daily. Otherwise, he is fully ambulatory but cannot do activities for an extended time due to discomfort in the eyes and mouth. He also presented with a rash that generalized to 80% of his body surface area. What is the diagnosis? As you guessed correctly, these are classic manifestations of chronic graft versus host disease. We have here inflammatory features of chronic graft versus host disease characterized by lichen planus like features of chronic graft versus host disease with disc pigmentation. The patient also had lichenoid GVHD of the lips and the mouth. Here on the left, we see Wickham striae, a lacy white network of fine lines, which are seen on the lips, and a rose of mucositis, which is seen on the right panel. Mr. Stiff was treated again with corticosteroids and did remarkably well with complete response in the skin and mouth. But approximately four months after, he presented with progressive stiffness of his upper extremities and is having trouble buttoning up his shirts and pants. What is occurring now? Well, the patient has fibrotic manifestations of chronic graft versus host disease, characterized by fasciitis and deep sclerosis, resulting in decreased range of movement. Why is chronic GVHD important? Well, it is a very challenging and complex syndrome of variable clinical features resembling autoimmune and other immunologic disorders. Manifestations of chronic graft versus host disease may be primarily inflammatory or fibrotic or both. Chronic GVHD may be restricted to a single organ or may be widespread, but patients typically have at least three involved organs. Treatment involves prolonged use of immunosuppression and chronic GVHD and its treatment is associated with high morbidity and negative long-term impact on quality of life and late mortality. To demonstrate this last point, the Philip and colleagues analyzed the association between chronic GVHD and non-relapse mortality in a recent cohort of 937 adult patients who received transplantation and developed chronic GVHD requiring new or change in systemic immunosuppression therapy. Included patients had been enrolled on two prospective observational studies through the chronic GVHD consortium. The median follow-up survivors was four years. The cumulative incidence and non-relapse mortality was 22.5% at five years, and it continued to increase over time at a projected 40% at 12 years. Chronic GVHD was reported as the most common cause of non-relapse mortality, approximately 38%, and was associated with organ failure, infection, or additional causes not otherwise specified. Severe skin and lung chronic GVHD manifestations was associated with increased non relapse mortality. Chronic GVHD is a result of complex mechanism and often involves inflammatory and fibrotic pathways. The initial phase is characterized by early inflammation due to injury of the host tissue. The release of inflammatory cytokines stimulate the activation of donor alloreactive T cells, which cause further cytotoxicity to host target cells. In the second phase, it is characterized by injury to the thymus and downstream loss of central and peripheral tolerance. There is loss of regulatory T and B cells and emergence of auto and alloreactive T cell populations. 
This can lead to chronic inflammation by active T, T helper 17 cells as they may escape immune regulation. The last phase is heralded by abnormal tissue repair. Activated macrophages stimulate the production of TGF beta and platelet derived growth factor alpha, which can lead to fibroblast activation, resulting in fibrotic phenotypes of chronic GVHD, such as scleroderma, scleroderma and bronchiobliterin syndrome. The National Institutes of Health Chronic GVHD projects of 2005 and 2014 have been essential in establishing standard guidelines and definitions for chronic GVHD diagnosis, staging, and response criteria for clinical trials. Eight organs or sites are scored and include the skin, mouth, eyes, gastrointestinal tract, liver, lungs, joint, and fascia, and the genital tract. Each organ or site is scored according to a four-point scale, zero to three, with zero representing no involvement and three reflecting severe impairment. Performance status is captured on a zero to three scale and check boxes note the presence or absence of other specific manifestations. However, these domains are not used to assess the chronic GVHD global severity. Now, if we reflect back to the case that I initially presented, our patient would be given a score one for his performance score, a score three for having about 80% skin involvement or rash, but a score zero for not having any sclerosis on exam. He would receive a score three for mouth given his severe oral symptoms. And when cal cal calculating the NIH global severity, he would be graded as having severe chronic GVHD as he has, as he has at least one organ with a score of three. The ideal treatment for chronic GVHD remains elusive and clear guidelines for treatment and management are lacking, but goals of therapy should focus on symptom burden reduction and prevention of progression to organ involvement by chronic GVHD, prevention of fibrosis and disability, increased ability to withdraw other immunosuppression while maintaining a response and improving quality of life and survival. Other important treatment considerations, including having a safety, safe, acceptable safety profile, a mode of delivery that is convenient for patients and healthcare providers, patient compliance, and of course, cost to the patient and the healthcare system. For the past 40 years, high dose corticosteroids of doses of 0.5 to one milligram per kilogram per day have remained the first line standard of treatment for chronic GVHD. The response rate is about 50% with greater than half requiring second line therapy within two years. Unfortunately, corticosteroids are associated with significant toxicities, including infection, muscle weakness, bone loss, avascular necrosis, cataracts, mood changes, hypoglycemia, mood changes, and other short-term and long-term side effects. Standard definitions have been published by the NIH and the European Blood and Marrow Transplant with the CIBMTR to help determine which patients require second-line treatment for chronic graft-versus-host disease. Chronic graft-versus-host disease steroid refractoriness or resistance is typically defined as chronic GVHD manifestations that progress while on prednisone doses of at least one milligram per kilogram per day for one to two weeks or stable chronic GVHD disease while on prednisone equivalent doses of 0.5 milligram per kilogram per day for at least four weeks. Steroid dependence has been defined as the inability to control chronic GVHD symptoms while tapering prednisone dose equivalents below um, 0.25 mg per kg per day in at least two unsuccessful attempts separated by at least eight weeks. Until recently, there was no standard of care for second line therapy. A number of second line agents of varying efficacy and toxicity have been evaluated over the years, including <clears throat> extracorporeal photophoresis, rituximab, imatinib, pentostatin, mycophenolate mofetil, mTOR inhibitors such as sirolimus, and interleukin-2. Typically, single institution retrospective and prospective studies have shown high response rates, but results have been difficult to replicate or interpret because of suboptimal study design. The focus of novel chronic GVHD treatments have shifted from the use of broad long-term immunosuppression with high dose corticosteroids towards agents that target specific mechanistic pathways relevant to the pathophysiology of chronic GVHD. Targets include alloreactive donor T cells, allo and autoreactive B cells, or regulatory T cells, 
our increased understanding into the pathogenesis of chronic GVHD, in addition to the development and refinement of chronic GVHD diagnosis, grading, response criteria, and important clinical trial endpoints, has now led to the FDA approval of three drugs for the treatment of chronic GVHD in the second line setting and beyond. We will discuss abrutinib first. Abrutinib was designed as a selective and irreversible inhibitor of the BTK protein, which plays an important role in B-cell receptor signaling and activation of B-cells and T-cells. Abrutinib was tested in a phase two trial of 42 patients with steroid chronic GVHD, mainly consi consisting of inflammatory features of chronic GVHD. The study resulted in an overall response rate of 67% and approximately 71% of responders continued to show a response for at least 20 weeks. Abrutinib received approval for the treatment of steroid chronic uh, GVHD, and this achievement highlights the success of multi-institutional collaboration with pharmaceutical support in developing a trial based on clear biologic rationale and preclinical data with defined working criteria for patient eligibility, disease response, and clinical endpoints. Abrutinib was then tested in the frontline setting in an international randomized placebo-controlled phase three trial for new onset chronic GVHD. The primary endpoint was overall response rate at 24 weeks. Results were presented at the European Hematology Associating meeting in 2021. In total, 95 patients received abrutinib prednisone and 98 received placebo with prednisone. At the time of the primary analysis, the primary endpoint did not meet statistical significance as 41% of patients treated with abrutinib prednisone had a response at 48 weeks versus 37% of patients receiving placebo with prednisone. Abrutinib prednisone resulted in clinically meaningful improvements in several other key endpoints, such as event-free survival, response duration, and improved patient-reported outcomes. Safety was consistent with the known profiles of abrutinib and prednisone and was similar between treatment arms. The positive trends observed in other important clinical endpoints, along with no additional safety trends and concerns, suggest that abrutinib may have some value in previously untreated patients with chronic GVHD. Moving on to ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib is a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor that suppresses T cell activation by interfering with cytokine receptor mediated signaling for a variety of pro inflammatory cytokines. This affects downstream proliferation of effector T cells, thereby decreasing tissue damage and fibrosis and, imp and impairs function of dendritic cells, resulting in decreased alloreactive T cell activation. Results from a phase three study of ruxolitinib versus best available therapy and steroid refractory chronic GVHD was recently reported. This was a multi-center randomized trial for patients 12 years or older. Investigators were able to have a choice of best available therapy and options included extracorporeal photophoresis, low-dose methotrexate, mycophenolate mofetil, serolimus, rituximab, imatinib, abrutinib, and others. Crossover from best available therapy to ruxolitinib was allowed for patients who had chronic GVHD progression or developed toxicity to best available therapy. The primary endpoint was overall response rate at week 24. In patients with chronic GVHD and inadequate steroid responses, ruxolitinib significantly improved multiple outcomes at week 24 compared with best available therapy. The overall response rate compared to um, the best available therapy arm was 50% versus 26%. Failure-free survival was significantly longer for ruxolitinib-treated patients and symptom improvement was greater with ruxolitinib. Best overall response up to week 24 was superior in the ruxolitinib arm as well as duration of best overall response. Anemia and thrombocytopenia were common adverse events in the ruxolitinib arm, and based on these results, ruxolitinib received a new FDA indication for the treatment of chronic GVHD. Belomocidil is an oral selective Rho-associated coiled coil kinase 2 inhibitor. An early phase 2A study known as KDO25-208 showed velomocidil to yield an overall response rate of 65% in patients with chronic GVHD who had previously received one to three prior lines of systemic therapy. This led to the FDA breakthrough therapy designation for velomocidil for treatment of patients with chronic 
GVHD who have failed two or more lines of systemic therapy. KDO213, otherwise known as the Rockstar study, was an open label randomized multicenter phase two study that reported results for safety and efficacy of belamosidil as daily or twice daily treatment for chronic GVHD after two to five prior lines of systemic therapy. Patients with chronic GVHD and two to five prior lines of systemic therapy achieved clinically meaningful results with belamosidil. High responses observed in both dose schedules with overall response rate of greater than 70% were seen. Belamosidil exhibited highly encouraging failure-free outcomes with FFS at 12 months of 58%. Responses were observed across all key subgroups and in all affected organ systems, including those with fibrotic disease. Median duration of response was about 50 weeks with 60% of patients maintaining response 20 weeks or more. 21% of patients discontinued corticosteroid therapy. There were clinically meaningful improvements in chronic GVHD symptoms as determined by the Lee um, chronic GVHD symptom score. And velomosidil was well tolerated with no new safety signals. Now I would like to direct your attention to drugs currently under study. Colony stimulating factor one or CSF-1 has been shown to promote the growth and differentiation of donor derived monocytes into macrophages, which in turn promote fibroblast activation and collagen production resulting in the various organ manifestations observed in patients with chronic GVHD. CSF-1 receptor blockade with axitilumab may reduce the number of these pro-inflammatory macrophages and play a meaningful role in the treatment of chronic graft-versus-host disease. Axitilumab is given as an intravenous infusion and showed clinical activity and was well tolerated in a phase one study. Dr. Stephanie Lee presented updated data from the phase one, two study at the American Society of Hematology this, in December of 2021. Axitilumab continued to lead to have to show high response rates and responses were seen across all chronic GVHD organs in patients who had previously failed two prior lines of therapy. More than half of patients had clinically meaningful improvement in chronic GVHD symptoms. And now axitilumab is now under study in a pivotal phase two study called Agave 201 to evaluate the efficacy and safety at three different doses in pediatric and adult patients with recurrent or refractory active chronic GVHD who have received at least two prior lines of systemic therapy. A second agent currently under investigation for steroid refractory chronic GVHD is a Batacept. It is a modified antibody that binds to CD80 and CD86 on antigen presenting cells and diminishes CD28 T cell activation. A Batacept with calcineurin inhibitor methotrexate was recently FDA approved for prophylaxis of acute GVHD in adult and pediatric patients undergoing hematopoietic stem cell transplantation from an unrelated donor. In a phase one study, a Batacept showed clinical activity and was well tolerated in patients with steroid refractory acute GVHD. Results from the phase two study were presented at the 2021 American Society of Hematology meeting. And this uh, study, 39 subjects with moderate to severe steroid refractory chronic GVHD received a Batacept at the defined dose and frequency. Patients having a response were eligible for treatment extension with a Batacept, and the primary endpoint was overall response rate. A Batacept achieved an overall response rate of 49% in patients with steroid refractory chronic GVHD, and a Batacept also led to durable reduction in prednisone dosing observed over time. Severe infections were not common and infusions were well tolerated. In November of 2020, the National Institute of Health Consensus Conference further set a forward thinking agenda to address gaps and needs in future chronic GVHD research over the next three to seven years. Four working groups review the progress made on key areas of chronic GVHD prevention and management, and also made recommendations on how to advance the field of chronic GVHD. I have highlighted here some summary points from the working groups focused on preemptive therapy, treatment of chronic GVHD, and highly severe or morbid forms of chronic GVHD. The preemptive therapy group, working group 2B, uh, focused on the question on how to best preemptively treat chronic GVHD. They came to a conclusion that 
uh, highly predictive risk assignment biomarkers are necessary to identify patients who need to be preemptively treated and to develop therapeutics that target multiple pathways in chronic GVHD. And lastly, to design new endpoints in clinical trial design for preemptive therapy of chronic GVHD. The treatment of chronic GVHD working group uh, recommendations were to foster and support a movement from steroids for all patients in the upfront treatment of chronic GVHD to that having minimal or no steroids in the upfront setting. They emphasized um, the importance of biological and personalized treatment, as well as incorporating biologic correlates to study the disease, the mechanism of action of the drug, and the response of the disease to the drug. Lastly, the highly morbid forms working group focused on, um, on uh, investigators to better phenotype highly morbid forms of chronic GVHD in cohort studies to as well recommend new treatment approaches with a focus on fibrotic changes or fibrotic manifestations of chronic GHD, and to have realistic endpoints for clinical trials in these highly morbid forms of chronic GHD, which may include um, patient reported outcomes and function or disability. In summary, the field of chronic GHD has made significant advances in the past 10 years. There are standardized definitions for chronic GVHD diagnosing, grading, and response. There are novel clinical trial endpoints that allow the field to effectively and successfully study the effects of new therapeutics on chronic GVHD disease. We have had a remarkable increase in the understanding of biologic pathways of chronic GVHD, which has helped lead to the development of new drugs and thereby potentially minimize exposure to harmful corticosteroids, preserve function and mobility, and overall improve quality of life and survival. With that, um, I thank you for your attention today.